Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God, our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Imagine that you are a film director and you're making a movie, uh, the title of which is God Has Mercy on All the Sinful People. So when you cast everyone in the movie, you look at all the actors that you've casted and you look at them and you say, okay, so we all understand that the name of the movie is God Has Mercy on All the Sinners. And they look at you and they say, yeah, we get it. And so then you give them all their scripts and you go and you do a table read through and you're reading all of the various scenes and all the dialogue and you say to them, okay, you can see here how on every page of this script, this story is about the God who has mercy on all the sinful people. And they say, right, yeah, we can see that. And so then the time comes to begin filming, so you bring them onto the set and you show them all of the set pieces that are meant to give visual life to the story and you can say all right see from all the stuff you can see around you how this is the story of how God has mercy on all the sinful people and they say right yeah we can we can see that so then all of a sudden you yell action and no sooner do you yell action than all of a sudden your actors throw down uh, uh, throw down whatever their props are and they look at you and they say hey what's going on here this is offensive why is God forgiving all the sins of these people uh, why is God having mercy on all the sinners here and so in this moment, you would most certainly be annoyed. It would sort of drive you crazy for rather obvious reasons. The name of the movie is clear. The story of the film is clear. What everything is about is clear. You've all signed up for this. Why all of a sudden, when the story starts to become real, the second the action kind of takes place, why is it that you suddenly have a problem with the story that you all had no problem with before? Well, in many ways, this is what Jesus is dealing with in our gospel text for this morning, in the calling of St. Matthew, when Jesus calls this sinful tax collector to come and follow him and hear about the kingdom of God and receive the forgiveness of sins. So when the Pharisees criticize Jesus for eating with tax collectors and sinners, this is basically their version of complaining about God's mercy the second that Jesus yells, action, on the set of this film, God has mercy on all the sinners. And in his response, when Jesus says to them, go and learn what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, he's basically looking at them and saying, look, flip your script to the title page. What's the name of the movie that you're in? You're not in a movie called God Makes People Earn His Love with the Sacrifices of Their Holy Sinless Lives. No, you're in a movie called God Has Mercy on All the Sinners. A movie where God gives his love to the world through the merciful blood of his son. So with these words from the Old Testament that Jesus references, these words that are meant to basically be a summary of the entire teaching of the scriptures, go and learn what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Jesus is looking at these Pharisees and saying, what's the title of the movie that you're in? It's as though Jesus is also saying, look, flip through your script, which is the Holy Scriptures. Here on page one is where God has promises to have mercy on Adam and Eve when they made themselves sinners through their disobedience, where God promises to send a Savior who's going to die and take away the sin that has taken them out of his kingdom. Flip your script to page 10. This is where God mercifully provides Abraham a sacrifice who dies in the place of his son, Isaac. Turn to page 20. This is where God mercifully sends Nathan to forgive King David's adultery. Here on page 30 is where Isaiah speaks of the suffering servant of Israel who is going to manifest the mercy of God by dying for the sins of the world upon the cross. So look at all these set pieces surrounding you, Jesus is essentially saying in this. All of these sets that the scriptures commanded you to build. Look at the temple, your chief set piece, with all of its animal sacrifices. These things are here to give visual life to the story of God having mercy on the sinners of this world by taking away their sins in the blood of me, his own son. So when I start showing God's merciful love to the sinners of this world by eating with them, by calling them to follow me, Why does this shock you? Why are you offended when I start doing exactly the same thing that the name of the movie says that I'm going to do? 
Well, very often we do something similar to what the Pharisees have done in our gospel text for this morning, but something that's also notably different. So while the Pharisees, so both of us all of a sudden have a problem the second that the film begins production, the second that filming begins and life starts, and we start to see this story come to life. But on, in the case of the Pharisees, their issue, their offense, is that God is having mercy. Our offense is more often that God is having mercy on sinners. It's the on sinners part that bothers us. The fact that all of a sudden, as the production rolls, we have a hard time understanding and believing and accepting the fact that God has actually cast us in the role of sinner. So here, so here we are basically looking at uh, whenever we grow angry at the preaching of the law, Whenever our hearts are filled with rage uh, and defiance, whenever the proclamation of God's word uh, and God's word against sin is proclaimed to us, we oftentimes uh, have the same thing where we get offended at this production that's coming to life. And we get offended that anyone would have the audacity to call us sinners. So I've, I've never done statistical research on this, but my guess would be that when someone in a congregation is engaged in some sort of sin, that requires the pastor to go talk to that person and try to bring him to repentance. My just kind of off the hand guess would be that 75% of the time that conversation doesn't go well at all. And the person who is entrenched in sin just becomes more hostile, becomes angrier and more defiant when he's told that he's a sinner. And when you place the scriptures in front of him, the scriptures that he's heard read to him throughout all of his life, life when he comes to church, all of a sudden he's saying, no, those words don't apply to me. But when you say to him, look, the very fact that you call yourself a Christian, that you clothe your name, yourself in the name of Christ, is an indication that you believe that you are a sinful person who can't earn the love of God through your own obedience and that you need Christ to take your sins away. So why are you all of a sudden surprised to find out that you actually have sins? Likewise, when in this kind of same thing of, uh, of just responding with hostility uh, in the same way when, when people will leave churches that they've gone to their entire lives when all of a sudden they hear things preached against that, that bother them. And oftentimes these aren't actually new things. They've heard these things preached against a million times before. And when they've heard these sins preached against before, they have thought to themselves, yes, absolutely, thus saith the Lord, this is the law of our God. But they said those words in a time in their lives when they weren't actually tempted to commit these sins. And then all of a sudden, when we're tempted to commit these sins, suddenly the tune, our tune changes. Suddenly the words of the scriptures, once again, no longer apply to our scenario. Suddenly God doesn't actually condemn us for doing the exact same thing that he's condemned people for doing all throughout the scriptures. And here in these moments, you kind of sit there and go, why do you all of a sudden now have a problem with this production of God has mercy on all the sinners of this world. Why does this now all of a sudden bother you? So look, you, you, you've come to a church that has preached against these things your entire life. You, you read the scriptures, and on every page of the scriptures you will find incidences and accounts of people who turned away from the law of God and absolutely were convinced that they themselves were not sinners. You've seen this story before. You've seen a thousand other characters play out the script. Why are you surprised when sin has done the same thing to you and all of a sudden filled your heart with things that are contrary to the, uh, to the will of God? And likewise, when it's the same thing when people just sort of silently sit and say nothing uh, in, when, they, when their hearts speak up in defiance of what the Word of God says to them while they may not leave their churches, while they may keep coming. And yet when it comes to their own lives, when they hear things preached against, they can continually convince themselves, no, that doesn't actually apply to me. And the idea that it actually would apply to me is the most offensive thing in all the world. Well, look, every week of your life when you've come to church you walk into the church building and there you see the font why is the font there to give visual aid to you and to remind you that you are a sinner who needs Christ to drown your sin in his baptism every week you see the altar why is the altar there so that you can see the place where the body and blood of Christ rests and the body and blood of Christ is here to take away the sins of the world which is which you have which is why you have been called here in the first place when you see the pulpit, here this stage prop in the production of God has mercy on sinners is here to remind you, to give visual life 
to God's proclamation that you are a sinner who needs Christ to take your sins away. So when this is the proclamation in every aspect of our lives as Christians, why are we all of a sudden so shocked and offended when that production comes to life and we discover that we've actually been cast in the role of sinners? Why are you yelling cut and insisting that it's so profoundly offensive to hear that you have sins that Christ needs to take away? Why? Because you're afraid. You're afraid to admit that you're a sinner because you don't think that Christ will actually take your sins away. So the Pharisees, on the other hand, objected to God having mercy. And they objected because they were filled with pride. Because they didn't believe that they actually needed God's mercy, so why would God dare to give it out to anyone else? But in our case, very rarely do I think it's actually the case that we don't think we actually need God's mercy. Rather, I think our unwillingness to acknowledge our sinfulness simply comes from the fact that we're basically saying to ourselves, God couldn't possibly forgive me. God couldn't really take my sins away. So if I just hide my eyes to them and treat them like they don't exist, then I can deal with all this fear. If I don't have this production of this, of this story of God having mercy on all the sinners surrounding me, if I, don't, if I don't have to avert my eyes from that, then I, can hide my, then I can hide myself away from the fear of condemnation, this fear that just won't go away. So we're offended by the promise of Christ's mercy because we simply don't believe that Christ will actually have mercy on us. But take out your script. Flip it to the title page. What's the name of the movie? God has mercy on all the sinners. So God will have mercy on you. He has had mercy on you. He always will have mercy on you. That's exactly why the scriptures were written. It's why the church was established. So that you could know and see and hear and believe and take part in the story of the God who gives His love to the sinners of this world through the merciful blood of His Son, Jesus Christ. So don't be afraid to admit that you're a sinner because your sins have already been destroyed by the mercy of Jesus Christ. Open your script to page 1. There God promised Adam and Eve that He would send His Son into this world to have mercy on them and take away their sinful disobedience. And there God promised you that the same Son, through the same sacrifice, would take away your own sinful disobedience as well. Open to page 10, where God promised Abraham a substitute who would die in Isaac's place. And there God promise you, promises you the substitute who has died in your place and takes away condemnation from you. Flip to page 20, where God promises David that his adultery has been put away forever. There, through those words, God promises you that your sins will, would also be written out of existence by the mercy that comes from David's son. Turn to page 30, where through the words of Isaiah, God promises his people that God is going to have mercy on them through the one who is pierced for their iniquities and who heals us with his stripes. And there, in those words, God makes the same promise of the same mercy and same Messiah to you. And in the cross, Jesus was the fulfillment of all those promises in the cross. Jesus was the offspring of the woman who crushed the head of the serpent, took away the spiritual death of the fall, and made you worthy to inherit eternal life once again. At the cross, Jesus was the sacrificial lamb who took the death sentence off of you and put it on his own head, who takes away the condemnation and wrath of God that you deserve and gave you all the glory and forgiveness that he earned for you. In his cross and his resurrection, Jesus took the words of Nathan and he spoke them to you. With his dying words, it is finished, Jesus proclaimed to you that he had now put away your sin. And when he burst forth from his empty tomb, Jesus proclaimed to you that you will not die, 
but you will only sleep for a moment in the grave because you have now been tied to the resurrection of Christ that you will see in all of its glory when Christ lifts you up out of his tomb on the last day. In that same death and resurrection, Jesus was the suffer your suffering servant who looked out at a sinner with your name and gave you peace with God through the shedding of his blood, just as he gave you the right to enter into that peace when he rose from the grave three days later. So don't be afraid to admit about yourself what the Bible says on every page of the script, that you're a sinner because your sins have now been taken away through the blood of Jesus Christ. Look around the sanctuary today at all these set pieces that bring visual life to the story of Christ's forgiveness and salvation. Why is this font here? To show you that when you were dead in your sins, Christ made you alive when he baptized you into the triune name. Why is the altar here? To show you that when you were lost outside of God's kingdom on account of your transgressions, Christ had mercy on you and brought you into his Father's house, gave you a seat at his Father's table, and now invites you to feast upon the righteousness of his very body and blood. Why is the pulpit here? To show you that when you deserved nothing, when you deserved to hear nothing from God but his condemnation, Christ gave you the word of mercy, forgiveness, life, and salvation. So don't be afraid to admit what these set pieces in the sanctuary tell you here today. Don't be, admit to, don't be afraid to admit what the scriptures tell you about yourself. Don't be afraid to admit what it is that you are confessing about your very nature in your title, in your name as a Christian. Don't be afraid to admit that you're a sinner because what's the name of the movie? God has mercy on all the sinners and God has had mercy on you. Amen.